problems are there with soil that is making you write books about it? You know, I'm a geologist, so thinking about writing books about soil is probably not the first thing on my agenda out of grad school. But if you look at the state of the world's soils today and how they've been treated through history, we've degraded something like a third of the world's farmland to the point that it's actually out of production. And you can go back to some um, Roman tax records, for example. There's areas of Syria and Libya that used to be very um, uh, rich agriculturally where it's hard to grow anything today because the soil simply isn't there anymore. So there's really two big problems in terms of soil degradation that someone like me would be very concerned about. One is the loss of the soil itself off the landscape, soil erosion. Because if you take a landscape that had healthy fertile soil and you strip it down to bedrock, you're not going to farm it very well. You're not going to support a lot of people off it. But the other problem is the degradation of soil. Uh, taking soil that was rich in organic matter, it was rich in biology, rich in life, very fertile, with a lot with high tilth. If you take that and you degrade it, turn it into more like California beach sand, so you're missing the organic matter, um, it's not as fertile. And it's that degradation problem is another big problem that uh, modern conventional agriculture has accelerated. So um, I've been concerned about both problems for a while now, and that's why Ann and I would have written sort of three books about soil. The first one, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, looks backwards through history at the destruction of soils around the world and their degradation, really since the dawn of agriculture. And it was a difficult book to finish writing because it kind of had a depressing view if you look back through history. But I started to turn that depression into optimism when we bought a house in North Seattle and my biologist, gardener, wife, Ann, uh, restored the fertility of our land, restored our soil. Um, and our understanding of that led to the second book, how microbes were the essential ingredient for rebuilding healthy, fertile soil. And the third book, Growing a Revolution, Bringing Our Soil Back to Life, was the one that looked at how do you apply those examples from the hidden half of nature that Ann and I wrote together to the, farming, to the problem of how do you restore soils on farmland around the world. And that, turned me, that process, that evolution of my own thinking, turned me very much into an optimist that rebuilding healthy fertile soils can be good not only for farmers and make them more profitable by using fewer agrochemicals, but it can also improve the quality of the food that we eat. Um, and it can help with other environmental problems. So I've gone on this full journey from being a full-on pessimist about soils at a global scale to being very much an optimist today. What is a quick summary of your book, Growing a Revolution? Well, in Growing a Revolution, uh, I traveled around the world to visit farmers who had already restored fertility to their land. Because, you know, as a geologist, I'm probably the wrong person to ask, you know, how should you farm on a particular piece of land? Farming is, a, is an amazingly complex applied ecological problem. Um, so I took the tact, instead of going and trying to tell farmers about how to farm, I went to farmers who'd already turned relatively degraded farms into really thriving, productive, profitable farms. And I said, what'd you do? How'd you do it? Give me a shovel, let's dig holes in your soils, and let's go to your neighbor's field, dig holes in their soils, and see the difference. And Growing a Revolution is really the story of both the backstory of soil degradation uh, through the course of previous civilizations, but it focuses much more on solutions, how farmers today are around the world, in uh, Costa Rica, in equatorial Africa, uh, across the U.S. from the Dakotas to Pennsylvania, how they've all embraced a new style of agriculture, a different way of thinking about how they treat the soil. And that's the real key, how one thinks about what we take for granted, the earth beneath our feet, um, and how they've used that to their advantage to adopt practices that build the fertility of their land and thereby allow them to, to keep producing large amounts of food in a very intensive agronomic settings, but also improve the land as they do it. And that turning around from having agriculture degrade the fertility of the soil, which is a big focus of the Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations book, and have farming become an agent of positive change, of building fertility, of improving the environment, while improving the on-farm economics as well. To me, that was the big transition, and that's what we write about in Growing a Revolution. What role does soil play in keeping the planet healthy? Boy, um, Earth is the only planet we know of that has soil. And so, well, what is soil? It's the interface between sort of the, the rocky interior of the Earth, the world of geology, and the bustling world of life that is really like a thin crust on the outside, the wrapper for Earth, if you will. And soil is the interface between those worlds. And it's the place where um, the processes that happen in the soil, um, through both the action of plants and the life in the soil, help get mineral elements out of the rocks 
and into plants where they can then enter the biological world. Because if we look at the, the gross chemistry of biology, uh, you know, it's carbon-based, you know, carbon-based land form, uh, life forms. When we think about science fiction movies, we're always looking for those in other places. Um, carbon is really sort of the, 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 the backbone of life as we know it. But it also, we also need nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and plants get the carbon that they build their, their bodies from out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis, combining carbon dioxide with water to build the carbohydrates and the other molecules that they build their bodies out of. They get nitrogen often in partnership with microbes that live around their roots, nitrogen-fixing bacteria as they're called. But those are only four of the elements that we need to build life. There's all kinds of other things, iron, zinc, copper, manganese. There's a whole list of micronutrients, things that we need in great part because they structure proteins um, and they help give functionality to organic molecules. And we get those, those all ultimately come out of rocks. And if you've ever done the experiment of taking a rock and just setting it out in the sidewalk somewhere and wanting to see how long it'll take to break down into soil, you know, your great grandkids are gonna be continuing that experiment for you. Nature builds soils very slowly, but they're critical to the cycles and processes that really drive the great wheel of life in the sense that how do dead things in a forest or a grassland, a natural ecosystem, get reworked into new life? It's through the breakdown of those once living things and the action of bacteria and fungi in the soil that repurpose and reprocess the, that material into compounds that can be taken up by new generations of plants. And if, if nothing that died ever broke down in the soil, if it was never decayed, we'd be you know, buried under once living organisms. Or it's been around a long time, and there's been a lot of life on it. Um, and if we stopped getting new elements out of the, the rocks, we'd have problems as well. But if you look at the general chemistry of a plant, it's really, or a person, they're totally different than a rock. And you can think of a soil as essentially a refining machine that through, through generations, through cycles of life and death, um, the life in the soil help pull those micronutrients we need out of the rocks where they're present in very, and usually in pretty low concentrations. They get them into the world of life and then it recycles through life and death and life and death and life and death over again. And it's that cycling that makes soils so important for terrestrial life, for the life on the continents, life out of the oceans. Uh, because without that, we'd be hard pressed to get all those elements we need out of the rocks in, in a short order. We rely on the concentration in, in plants and animals to provide what we need to power our bodies. What kinds of minerals are in the soil and why is that important? Yet when you look at what it takes for us to be healthy, um, we tend to think of calories as the fuel that powers our bodies, but we also need mineral elements that ultimately came out of rocks, that's when they're called minerals, um, that help serve functions, help uh, structure proteins. If you look at sort of a, a carbohydrate molecule or sort of the, the basic carbon-based backbone of life, sort of a simple or complex sugar, if you start adding metals into that structure, it starts to fold it. You can start actually build proteins and it's their three-dimensional geometry that actually gives them functionality in biological systems. And it's these mineral elements that we don't need very much of, but we sure need them all, uh, uh, to, to drive the processes in our body that help us support health. A lot of these sort of very specialized molecules um, depend on mineral elements of one sort or another. And there's, there's a whole list of mineral micronutrients, some, and there's major elements that we need as well, things like potassium and, and phosphorus um, that ultimately came out of rocks. Potassium is really common in the bulk chemistry of rocks. Phosphorus is a lot rarer, um, but both are high-graded and brought into biological circulation by the processes in the soil. But it's a lot of those mineral micronutrients, um, copper, zinc, uh, selenium, things that we need in little amounts that if you get too much can actually be toxic but that we really need enough of to basically allow our bodies to build the compounds that help give, give them our functionality, that help drive our immune system, help drive our resistance to disease, for example. Um, so if we don't get enough of the mineral micronutrients out of the rocks and into our crops and into our livestock and thereby into us when we eat them, uh, we're, there's a different kind of uh, malnutrition. It's called hidden hunger, which is when you get enough calories but you're not getting enough of the mineral micronutrients that your body needs to be healthy. Because it takes different elements for us to grow 
than to be healthy. They, 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 they complement each other. I mean, we obviously need enough calories. Starving to death is a horrible way to go. Um, and there's this other style of malnutrition, though, where you have enough calories, but you're not getting enough mineral micronutrients. And that's the kind of malnutrition that tends to affect the developed world. What happens if a farmer's soil is deficient in minerals or other nutrients that crops need? Yeah, so you can look at the soil in a farmer's field in relation to the abundance of minerals in two ways. The first way is just, are those minerals there in the first place? And there's certain soils developed on certain rocks around the world that are deficient in certain minerals. Like say you're farming on a limestone uh, geology. It's a calcium carbonate rock. So there's a lot of calcium and a lot of, a lot of carbonate in the, in, the, in the rock. So there's not gonna be a deficiency of calcium in the soil. But there may be deficiencies in other elements that don't tend to be in limestone. And there, there's certain uh, rock types around the world where you can just map the geology based on the plants growing on them because of the deficiencies in mineral elements. You can go to, say, California, and there's um, the serpentinite terrain there. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of rock that has a different mineralogy than most other rocks. And you have a completely different um, um, suite of plants growing on it. So, First question is in terms of minerals in the soil and whether they're deficient or not is what's the geology under your farm? Because you might need to actually add something or um, it may take more to get the micronutrients out because they're not there in much abundance. But if you actually look at most farmland soils around most of the world, there's enough of most mineral elements in the rock particles, in the soil particles, to actually grow healthy crops and support healthy livestock and healthy people. But getting them out of the rock particles is not a simple matter. And that's where soil life comes in, where the biology comes in. The bacteria and fungus that live in the soil, uh, a lot of them, some of them specialize in getting um, particular kinds of elements out of the, the, the mineral particles in the soil or, or straight from the bedrock. And that's things like phosphorus, for example. Uh, there's an awful lot of phosphorus in the world's farmlands now that's been added over the last hundred years through fertilizer application that's tied up in an insoluble form of phosphorus. So it's not available to a plant. If you think about the roots of a plant as a straw that can draw up water from the soil, whatever's in that water can help nourish the plant. But nothing in the soil that's insoluble, that's not going to be dissolving in that water, is going to be in the water to help nourish the plant. And Bacteria, plants themselves will exude acids out of their roots and the fungus in the soil can exude acids and the bacteria and the fungus can work together to actually get particular mineral elements, micronutrients, out of soil particles and they will actually bring them and trade them to plants for sugars that the plants exude out of their roots to feed mic microbes in the soil. So there's sort of two ways to look at a mineral deficiency in the soil. The first one is an absolute deficiency. You've got the wrong rock type for that kind of mineral. And you know, if you only eat food off of the farms, off of those rock types, without some kind of mineral supplementation, you'll be short on something. Um, the other way to look at it is it's there in the soil, but it's not getting into the plants because our agronomic practices can actually um, dismantle the, the fungal mines that are actually getting that material out of the rock particles and disrupt the, the subterranean interstate system where the, the microbial truckers are bringing that mined material back and trading it to the plants. And there's, you know, many of our practices in modern conventional agriculture disrupt those systems. What the practices are nullifying that process? Modern practices that disrupt life in the soil include everything from tillage, from plowing, um, which was a big subject of uh, the first book in the Dirt Trilogy that Ann and I wrote, um, the Dirt Book. Um, but they also include the over-application of nitrogen fertilizers, because that can actually stimulate a lot of short-term um, bacterial explosion in the soil, because you're feeding it nitrogen and nutrient, but if the bacteria then consume a whole lot of soil organic matter, as a result of that, you kind of draw down the batteries of the soil. So you get a boost, of, a short-term boost of fertility, but you degrade it over the long run. And if we look at the organic matter content of, say, farmland soils across North America today, they're roughly half of what they were at the, at the time of European colonization, you know, through you know, a fuzzy averaging over the, over the continent. And you can think we've basically drawn down the native fertility of our soil by about 50% in that sense. And that's one of the reasons why um, we're so dependent on modern agrochemical agriculture is that you can grow big plants and high yields in a very degraded soil if you add the major elements that plants need for growth. But what are they then missing? 
they'll be missing uh, some of those mineral micronutrients. Um, they'll be missing the beneficial metabolites that microorganisms make from the sugars that plants push out into the soil to recruit and feed them. And so there could be an impact on crop health. Um, so the, the state of the soil and how it is affected by our farming practices is actually a big concern because you know, one of the things about being a geologist is that we tend to think of time in pretty large chunks. And if you think about how we would sustain farming over the course of a civilization, you know, you're not talking about maintaining yields for this year or a decade or even a century. You're talking about doing it for centuries, if not millennia. And we've had big problems with that in the past.